Hi, everyone, and welcome to the International Interprofessional Mentorship Meeting. I am Dr. Kate Barlow, the founder of the program and your host for today's meeting. It's March 24th, 2021, and today Dr. Amber Armstead is here to talk to us about OT's role in chronic HIV management. Please mute yourselves during the presentation and unmute yourself whenever you would like to ask a question. You can also type your questions into the chat box and I will ask the questions for you. In order to receive a certificate of attendance, please enter your name and email into the chat box now, and you will need to remain on the webinar until the presenter is finished. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will have an optional meet and greet. Thank you all for coming today and let's get started. Thank you, Dr. Armstead for coming. Yeah, it is my absolute pleasure. And I, um, this is my third guest lecture this week. But this is the one I've been actually the most excited slash anxious about because of the group that I'm speaking to. So anyways, um, good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Barlow said, my name is Amber Armstead, and we're going to talk about our role as occupational therapists in the management of chronic HIV. And these are OTs that I'm speaking to, correct? Best yes, OTs. Best profession ever. Okay. So hopefully by the end of our discussion today, you'll understand the needs of people living with chronic HIV, those physical and mental health issues and their psychosocial needs. We can discuss the application of the model of human occupation for people living with chronic HIV and identify our opportunities as OTs to best serve this population using what we know how to do best, which is occupations. So where do I begin? So let's talk about myself. So as I said, I'm Amber Armstead. I'm an OT. My doctorate's in public health, and that is all by design. I did all of that on purpose. Um, when I left undergraduate, I knew I wanted a DRPH, the doctorate of public health, and I knew I wanted to be a clinician of some kind as well. So that led me, I fell into OT by complete accident. Now, why do I care about HIV so much? Personal story, but definitely self-disclosure. So I have a cousin, had a cousin, who died of AIDS in 2009 here in Houston, AIDS-related issues. And I didn't understand, because I didn't really know a ton about HIV, how that happened. Like, I didn't think people were still dying of AIDS. I didn't think that was a thing anymore. And this is 2009, and I had been working as an OT for about a year and a half at this point. So tell them my age. I've been an OT for 13 plus years now. Um, this is year 14. And I just didn't understand how this was happening. Like, how did how this happen? Wonderful soul. She um, was trafficked by her boyfriend. She met the wrong guy. He trafficked her. She ended up selling her body to feed their habit and contracted HIV. And then she ended up with cancer, which then threw her HIV, which she really wasn't taking that great a care of herself at the time anyway into actual AIDS and then that's what killed her. And she was 27 and so was I at the time. And basically I decided because I didn't know a whole lot more than the basics, like I knew how to prevent AIDS, right? I knew how to prevent HIV, I knew how people got it, but I didn't understand the intricities that came along with it. So I basically became a one woman, I'm gonna save the whole planet, fix everybody, save the world because I couldn't save my cousin. So, that being said, that is why I'm on this crusade. And once I started looking at what HIV was, and then I recognized that it's a chronic disease, I'm like, why are OTs not doing more with this? So that's what led us here. So let's talk about the physical toll that HIV takes on people. Because when I talked to occupational therapists about this, and the first time I did one of these lecture type things was in 2016, when I was in the middle of doing my doctorate, most OTs didn't know this information. So I recognize this and say, because I didn't either until I looked it up, this is something that we need to talk about. So the physical toll that HIV takes on individuals is that once the virus enters the body and it crosses that blood brain barrier, it leads to central nervous system issues, decreased balance and coordination, cognition is decreased and vision problems ensue. There's also the respiratory issues that accompany HIV. Right, and we, we hear about this. If you know anything about HIV or AIDS, you know that a lot of the individuals who end up succumbing to the disease usually succumb to the pneumonia that they got because their immune system is so compromised from the HIV and the AIDS. So there's breathing issues that accompany HIV. There's also cardiac issues. These individuals have decreased activity tolerance, 
a lot of them are more susceptible to strokes and heart attacks. And we see that a lot on the hospital side here in the US, particularly Houston, and blood pressure issues, because for some reason their blood pressure is elevated, which is why the strokes tend to happen with this population, especially if they're not taking their medication. Digestive issues ensue as well. You'll hear a lot of clients living with HIV complain about frequent diarrhea. Kidney infections are a big deal with this population. A lot of these individuals living with HIV are on kidney dialysis or they're awaiting transplants. And the good thing is, is now, at least here in Houston, and I worked at Houston Methodist for years and things of that nature, they were starting to finally transplant people who were living with HIV, because for years they wouldn't because they said HIV was a terminal illness, but it's not, it's chronic. So now people are actually able to get these transplants that they need now. Skin lesions, which back in the early HIV days, the late 80s, early 90s, were usually ways people could tell if someone had it and if someone, even though you can't tell by looking at someone if they have HIV, but I digress. Shingles is something that um, occurs with these individuals and they end up having those skin lesions that look like that. And then you have the musculoskeletal issues, bone mass density issues that accompany HIV and accompany the medication that people take to keep them living. Muscles atrophy, they weaken. And you guys already know, because we're OTs, you can't have coordination without strength. So if an individual has muscle atrophy and strength issues, their coordination is going to be bad. So this is a physical toll of what HIV can do to the body. And we're OTs and we know how to address every single one of these issues. The thing is, like I said, a lot of OTs didn't even know this was something that they needed to think about with these clients. So that's just a physical toll. Let's talk about the mental toll. So here, as I stated, once HIV crosses the blood brain barrier, which happens pretty soon after the person becomes infected with HIV, it can lead to brain central nervous system type issues. So there's this phenomenon called HIV associated neurocognitive disorder, otherwise known as hand. That's why I have the cheesy hand here because gotta be cheesy in these Zoom times. And what that is, is it's basically this phenomenon that says people living with HIV are going to have cognitive issues. Now, there are three types of hand. Asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment is the type of hand where the individual doesn't affect their functioning at all. So again, typically, once HIV crosses that blood-brain barrier, there's going to be some cognitive decreases. But if the individual knows that they have have the virus, they've been tested, they've been told and they get on their medication pretty quickly, they can live in that asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment. They can exist there where it just might be every once in a while they may forget something. Every once in a while they may need a reminder. It's not affecting how they function in life. But then we have the mild neurocognitive disorder. And with this one, this is when, okay, they're, they're kind of forgetful and they know they're forgetful. So if they're really self-aware, they know, okay, I need to start using calendars. Or I got to write stuff down. Or they recognize it might take them longer to process information now. Because now, instead of them just being able to catch on real quick to something, they need to sit with it a bit, process it. So memory, processing, executive function, all these things will be affected, but just mildly, where it's there. And again, if they have that self-awareness, they, they may know how they can kind of get around it, but it's not, it's affecting their function, but not to the point where it's, you know, detrimental. They can't remember how to do things and of that nature. And then you have the last one, HIV associated dementia. This used to be called AIDS dementia. It still is in some parts of the literature, but not everywhere. These individuals are going to present just like a dementia patient, exactly like a dementia patient, where short-term memory, gone. Um, they're not able to process the information that you gave them. Even if you give them an exorbitant amount of time, it's just not there. And it's going to progress, just like it would with a dementia patient. These individuals are going to have a difficult time performing ADLs. These individuals are going to have a hard time doing IADLs. Their safety is going to be called into question. They won't be able to live safely alone. These individuals will need someone with them to be safe, like it would be with a dementia patient. So... All of these things are very common in people living with HIV. And again, a lot of the OTs that I talked to didn't know this existed. And here's another opportunity for us, right? Because we know how to address these things. 
And then there's this beautiful phenomenon that people living with HIV have to deal with called accelerated aging. People living with HIV age 10 to 15 years faster than the rest of society, unfortunately. And with that accelerated aging comes these geriatric syndromes that you might see in a 40 year old that you wouldn't think you'd see until this person was 55 or over. That's that dementia we just talked about. Depression, delirium, incontinence, balance issues and vertigo, falls, spontaneous bone fractures, and I'm gonna talk about that. Failure to thrive and maybe neglect and or abuse. These are all geriatric syndromes. You can find them in our literature, but also these are things that people living with HIV are more susceptible to and at significantly earlier ages than the rest of society. And if you're an OT treating this population, or if you just have a client that happens to have HIV, this is something you need to be cognizant of. And again, how we can use what we already know, our beautiful scope of practice to address this. So why should we care as OTs about any of this? Because, and there's gonna be a lot of self-promotion of OT throughout this, guys, so just be prepared. I love our profession, I have such a passion for it, and y'all apparently do too because you're here. So why should we care? OTs are masters. We are experts at chronic disease management. We know how to do it better than everybody else. And the reason we do is because we look at the entire person and not just their deficit. We don't just look at the one thing that's wrong with them. We look at everything and figure out how we can help them use the strengths that they, that they have to help improve those weaknesses or, or opportunities to improve in order to get them to live the life that they want to live, right? So when I started my dissertation, which is where this is going, it was about falls. Why? Because falls are a hot button topic. They're sexy, but falls are also the leading, one of the leading causes of death and disability in the United States. When people fall, it can lead to them being either institutionalized and being taken out of their home or dying. And people fall a lot. And the older you are, the more likely you are to fall according to the data. But remember, people living with HIV age quicker so they're having to deal with these issues earlier. I'm in my late 30s. If I fall, ha ha, I just ran um, a half marathon. If I fall, which I did, um, because it was muddy. Luckily, it was a virtual one, so nobody was watching me as if I had been in a crowd, so that was good. But anyways, when I, fought, when I fell, I just got up and I brushed myself off. And I'm like, oh, silly Amber, and just got up and kept running. But if I was someone living with HIV and had fallen, I might have broken a bone. Why? Two reasons. The antiretroviral therapy, their treatment, depletes bone mineral density, which leads to osteoporosis and bone spontaneously breaking. Also, HIV itself leads to a vitamin D deficiency, which can also lead to that bone mineral density deficiency, which can then also. So either way, it's like a double-edged sword. If they take their medication, they're prone to, to osteoporosis. And if they don't take it, they're prone. But it's better for them to take it. So as I was saying, falls are a public health problem. People with chronic diseases are more likely to fall and HIV is a chronic disease. People with HIV can fall for a number of reasons, but they, at least in my research, this is what they were related to. So antiretroviral therapy adherence, people taking those life-saving drugs to make HIV chronic and to help them continue to live as long as possible. But then there's ADL dysfunction, and we know this. Remember all those physical symptoms we just talked about and those cognitive symptoms that we talked about up there. Any one of those symptoms can have a decrease in your independence with performing your self-care, your ADLs and your IADLs. Then there's frailty, which is one of those accelerated aging things. And frailty, there are five symptoms to frailty. There's weakness, fatigue, weight loss, poor balance, and slow gait. And again, we start to see frailty naturally around 70 to 75 years old, of age and older. But remember, these individuals age quicker. So they start showing these symptoms significantly earlier than that. And then there's incontinence, bowel and bladder. And as OTs, we know how to do medication adherence. Medication management's an IADL. ADL 
we are the ADL kings and queens, right? That's what we do, that's who we are. Frailty, we address all those issues. And in continents, we do toileting management and hygiene and all those things. We know how to address all of these things. But as OTs, if we're unaware that these are things we need to address with this population, then we're going to miss something when we treat that. And likewise, if these individuals living with HIV don't know that these things are coming, how are they going to manage it? Which led me to my bigger project. And treating people living with HIV using the model of human occupation. So everybody, when they're in school, hates the theory classes, right? I just finished teaching a theory class in the fall. And I tried to spice it up as much as I can. And my students apparently liked it. They gave me good evals. But the models are the foundation of our clinical reasoning. They are how we become the clinicians that we are. And without those models, even though everybody hates learning about them, but that really is how we figure out how we're going to treat a client. My personal favorite is MOHO, which is why I used it to develop this program. And in my model, I address HAND, which is the HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. We address FALLS. And we do both of those things because what I want to do, my desire, other than just saving the world, is helping people to successfully age in place. Let people be able to age where they want to age and live a long, happy, healthy, good quality of life in their own home. And in order to do that, they need those knowledge and skills to be able to maintain their functional independence as safely as possible. Those knowledge and skills are performance capacity. Performance capacity is in the model of human occupation. So you see, I'm trying to draw it all back together. So I started off doing just a basic, wasn't that basic, it took me forever, um, case control study, looking at um, electronic medical record from the hospital I was working at. I went through IRB at my school and at my job. And I looked at how um, antiretroviral therapy adherence, ADL function, and how those two things related to falls with people living with HIV. And I'm gonna blaze through this because this isn't really what I wanna talk about. I just wanna tell you how I got to the last study. So the first study was this one. And so what we found that I had 204 people who met my criteria in our database of the um, 1,446 that I had. Most of the people, my average age was 50. 0.2, give or take um, 10 years. Um, my population was overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly black. What we found is according to this, I had 68 people who fell, 136 that hadn't fallen. That's gonna be the same for the next study too, which is why I'm telling you guys this. Women were less likely to fall. Women who were compliant with their medication were less compliant to fall, less compliant, sorry, less likely to fall. And balance, um, people who had terrible balance, of course they were gonna fall, right? I mean, these are things that we know that at least the data is telling us this. Like we know this is OTs, but us as OTs need to do a better job of publishing our work so that people know that we've got this to support it. But yes, and actually this article will be coming out in OT and healthcare later this year. So this one is about to get published, but, um, but yeah. And so anecdotally, and I can say this based on me anecdotally, men were more likely to fall in my study, even though the literature says that women are more likely to fall, but anecdotally, it's because women will report it. Falls are self-report, right? They are. Unless we see it, then we can't say definitively if they fell or not. And also, at least here, at least in the Houston area where I've done all of my OT practice for the most part, um, women, when they fall, they were, they're like, I don't want to ever fall again. What, what is it that I can do so that I don't ever fall again? Like, what, what equipment do I need? You know, just tell me. Whereas men won't admit that they fell. <laughs> like their wives will tell us. And these are not just HIV patients, but these are patients in general. Um, usually the women are like, I don't want to fall and break a hip. I don't want to leave my house. How can you help me not do that again? Versus, and they'll, they'll use the canes. They'll use the walkers. Whereas some of my men are like, I look like an old man. I don't want to use a walker. So there's a whole compliance issue there. But again, my, my data supported it. But just saying, that's what usually happens. That's what happened in my study. 
And so the implications that my study told me basically were that I need to do a bigger study. That was just a case control. So that was just a snapshot in time. But I need to do a more longitudinal study where I'm following people for longer periods of time. And we can tell if there's if medication adherence, ADL function, balance strategies, and improving their environment really does help reduce the likelihood of falls. Again, I'm an OT. I know that it does, but we need the data to say that. And then other studies. The one thing that my electronic medical record did not tell me was anything about cognition and that bothered me. Unless the person had a psych consult, even though there was an OT eval attached to every one of those patients, there was nothing about their cognition there. I mean, they did delirium screens, but a delirium screen is not the same as a cognitive test, right? So that bothered me. So I really wanted to know more about cognition, about how these individuals cognitive function was working and how that was either impeding their function or enhancing it. And I also wanted to know how many people fell after the OT saw them. So the OT saw them for eval, but there's no follow-up. Again, it's a snapshot in time, right? When you do a case control, so it's not telling me what happened after the OTs gave them their education. So that's what I'm looking into. I'm getting there. My second study was another case control study because I had an epidemiologist on my dissertation committee, so I did case control studies to help support my qualitative one. But um, I looked at frailty and continence and how those two things relate to falls among people living with HIV. What we found, remember those five categories of frailty that I talked about at the beginning? The people who were non-frail, who had none of those things, no weight loss, no fatigue, none of those issues. Oh, we have a hand up. Mr. Dennis, would you like to ask your question? Is he frozen? He might be. I'll, I'll type something in the chat box. Okay. Okay, well, shall I keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So with this study, with the frailty, what we found was those who were non-frail, of course they weren't going to fall. There wasn't anything wrong with them. They didn't have any of the weight loss. They didn't have any of the, you know, any of those other symptoms that would lead to, to a fall. Those who were frail, who were known as frail already, well, they were already bed bound. So of course they're not going to fall either. The ones who fell were those pre-frail individuals, those ones who had one to two of those symptoms that I talked about earlier. And the reason for that is they didn't realize how bad off they were. They still thought they were doing pretty well. And so those were my fallers in that group. And then of course, individuals with balance issues were going to fall. Women were less likely to fall again in this one. Now the incontinence, and this is a study, and this one's been published already. And this is my least favorite of all three of my studies, but um, and it, it's my least favorite because I was wrong in my hypothesis, but incontinence, in my head, because I'm an OT, people who are incontinent should be falling, right? But that's not what my data said. And the honest to God truth was out of my 204 people, my 68 people who fell, only 10 of those people were incontinent. So my number wasn't high enough for me to gain statistical significance with that one. And that, that was the truth, but I was just like, this is wrong. And but yeah, this was actually the first one I published, which I thought was so funny because this is literally my least favorite of my studies. So what I found out here, again, was what were the implications for OT practice? How can we continue to move forward with this? So again, making another cohort longitudinal study that follows people long term to see if us as OTs combating those symptoms of frailty by screening for them, trying to improve balance issues and reduce falls. Also addressing incontinence, even though it wasn't statistically significant, I still think it's a problem and addressing the cognition will help lead to um, a reduced likelihood of falling with these individuals and improve their overall quality of life. So all of that, which is a lot, I know, led me to this. That was my, my final study. This is my crown jewel. And this one I'm about to submit for publication, but I have already presented this at um, our annual AOTA conference. And basically, I wanted to know how people living with chronic HIV perceive the management of their symptoms. What, what were they thinking? So my questions were basically, what practices do people living with chronic HIV use to manage the physical and cognitive symptoms associated with HIV? What are they doing to manage their symptoms? 
and then how we as occupational therapists can apply MOHO to improve occupational performance and participation for people living with chronic HIV. So this is what we're gonna talk about more today than anything else. Like I said, this was my crown jewel. It was my favorite of the papers, but I'm also a qualitative researcher, which is why this is my favorite because this was my qual paper. So basically my inclusion criteria were these individuals living with HIV who had been diagnosed with not only the HIV, but they had been told they had hand of, of some sort and or had a fall or a fall related injury. And of my 17 participants, they all had both because usually you will. Um, they had to be 18 years or older. They had to understand oral and written English and they had to be currently using combined antiretroviral therapy medication, their meds for this. If the individual had done any drugs, any illicit drugs or used any alcohol 24 hours prior to my interview, they were excluded. Again, that's self-report. So I didn't know if that was true or not, but in my consent form, that was one of my questions and that's what I asked and that's what they said. So um, at all of 17 of my participants had at least one of these comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, vision issues, diabetes or sensory issues. The sensory issues come because remember the central nervous system issues, there's a lot of peripheral neuropathy that accompanies HIV. Peripheral neuropathy is going to make it very difficult to walk without falling if you have other issues too. And if you're not aware of that peripheral neuropathy. So as I was saying with this, my sample for this, just like it was for my other two studies, was overwhelmingly Black, overwhelmingly African-American, um, followed closely by um, Caucasian, and then we had one who identified as other. 77% of my population was compliant with their medication. They were taking their ART faithfully, and they knew their numbers, they knew their viral load, they knew their CD4 count, they could tell you everything about it. Um, the other 33%, not so much. Sorry, 23%, I couldn't see that. Not so much. Fun fact about my um, population. So my population was older. My average age for my qualitative piece was also in the 50s. And all of my clients who were over the age of 50 were compliant. They could tell you everything about everything and they were really, they knew what was going on. Those who I had who were younger, they were mine who were missing doses and were having memory issues. Um, one of the participants was a 28-year-old who had just had a stroke, and he was only taking his medication then because he had had a stroke and he was recovering, and they put him on his medication. So he was not compliant before then. He also told me he was in denial about the whole situation, which makes sense. My population was mostly male. I'm gonna go back one just so y'all can see this. My population was mostly male. I did have um, four women and one transgender woman who were um, in my study. The majority of my clients were single, but I did have one who was divorced and, and then you know domestic partnerships. Sorry, two divorced domestic partnerships. My annual income for my, for my participants here were 10,000 or less, which is actually very low in the United States. That is um, poverty line. A lot of them were on disability and um, they weren't, they didn't have very much money, but we had a few that, um, that did. Most of them had been living with HIV for greater than 10 years at the time that we um, did this study. And, um, all but one had graduated from high school here in this study. So that tells you about some of the break, the breakup of that. Um, the really cool thing was they were really happy to talk to me. And I, I know that they were because I was a black woman. And as opposed to my mentor, who was a white male, um, they, they were telling me their life stories. And I don't think they would have told him nearly what they told me. But um, I found out how most of them contracted the virus, very sad stories, um, sexual assault, just crimes, things of that nature, and how they had basically just been living their lives with it. And like I said, the older individuals who've been living with it for 10 plus years were compliant. They, they took their medication, they knew everything about it, about themselves, their bodies. 
and they could tell me about the symptoms that they had and um, what the different medications did to them and all those things. So they were really cognizant of that. So my design, again, it was qualitative. I did semi-structured interviews based on, you know, the contrast of MOHO, basically. Snowballed um, sampling. Basically, I was just grabbing people as I could. I, you know, after I met with my IRBs, I went through IRBs at the different um, HIV clinics around the Houston area, posted my flyers, and people were with my personal information on there, told them if they got a $5 gift card, couldn't say it was for Starbucks, but that's what it was. And I was funding my own research. So yeah, it was only $5. And um, I got people to participate and it was, it was wonderful. I audio recorded these interviews, I had them transcribed, and then I coded them. And then my mentor coded them after me, and we compared to make sure that my codes were correct. They were, and we just kept going. And then from there, I was able to create my model. Here's my quick um, interview guide, and you guys will see that when you get your, it's kind of small. But basically, I just asked them about their medication, falls, memory, how they're feeling, anything that they would want other people to know that would improve their lives what needs they feel like were being ignored. And it was semi-structured. So even though I have these questions, I kind of let them just talk to me for me to get the information that I needed. That's the beauty and the art of a qualitative interview is that you can do that. You can have them, you can redirect them, which I did when they got way off topic, but I was able to just get even more information than I necessarily needed that just helped inform my study just because I allowed them to talk and say their piece. And they just, a lot of them just wanted someone to hear them. And I can understand that. When you're a member of a marginalized group, it's hard for people to hear you sometimes. And so when someone is willing to hear you, you talk to them. So based on all of that, I use the information and I kind of put them, the themes all kind of because of the way the questions were asked fell into the MOHO constructs. So we talked about occupational participation, what these individuals did um, daily, how, how they were able to do it, what they enjoyed doing. We talked about those person variables, you know, volition, their motivation to do things, their habituation, what their habits and routines look like, their performance capacity, what knowledge and skills that they have already to help them do things and what knowledge and skills that they need. We talked about their environment, both their physical environment, what their home look like, what their work life look like, what did everything look like? And um, we talked about their social environment. Did they have social support? Did they have people who could help them? And then all that together, how did that improve their occupational performance or how did it hinder it? What did that look like? Were they able to engage in the things they needed to and wanted to engage in in the best possible way, in the most meaningful way, in the most functional way, in the safest way. So we talked about all of that. And from all that information, we got this beautiful model here that I love. So this is MOHO with my HIV stuff put into it. So I don't know if you guys remember, the reason I've always loved MOHO is that Gary Kilhoffner, who's the guy who created it, was also a DRPH like myself. His doctorate was in public health. And so, when I was doing my doctorate in a, in a non-OT related field, his stuff always lined up with what I wanted to do. So it just kind of made sense. And I just love MOHO, which has always made sense to me. So self-explanatory, but I'm going to explain it because that's why I'm here, right? So volition, motivation. How can we motivate our clients living with HIV to take their medication? Well, if we explain to them what happens when they don't take it, and the benefits of what happens when they do, people are gonna be more likely to, to be motivated, right? Also, if we give them the tools that they need, so I'm shifting over to performance capacity here. The one thing that I will say about every one of my participants, despite the lower socioeconomic status, is that they all had smartphones. The smartphone may not have been like the fanciest, newest, whatever, but they all had one. But even without a smartphone, a flip phone has calendars in it. Flip phone has timers. The flip phone has alarms. Our cell phones have these things built in. You don't have to buy an app or do anything like that for it, right? So if we can impart on our clients why medication adherence is so important and teach them, give them the skills they need to like plug that into their phone, set alarms, do those things and make that part of their routine, there's that habituation, then 
we're improving their outcomes here. Same thing, physical activity. So these individuals were all falling. All of them had fallen at least once, all of them had. And as I stated at the beginning with those physical issues that come with you know, HIV, falls are going to happen. But we don't want them to fall because the HIV and the medication causes bone mineral density deficiencies, which can lead to a fracture if they fall. We don't want that for them. So engaging in physical activity, we know as OTs, will reduce the likelihood of falling. So, and most of the time when people hear physical activity, they're like, oh, I don't wanna exercise. Okay, I get that. But you can also talk to people about what they enjoy doing, what's important to them, what, again, occupations, right? So if they hate running, but they like to dance, well, dancing is physical activity. That's a way to engage in physical activity and get stronger so that you can improve your balance. There are just so many ways we can introduce physical activity. Walking. During this whole COVID pandemic, that's been the big thing, right? Is everybody's like, just go outside, get some fresh air. Things of that nature. And again, giving them the knowledge and skills that they need, so performance capacity in order for them to be able to engage in that physical activity and then making that part of their routine, there's our habituation, so that they're able to improve their outcomes. And then the memory aids. Remember, HIV crosses that blood-brain barrier, it will reduce cognition. So these people have phones. Showing them, like I said, how to plug different reminders into their phones, setting different alarms to help them using checklists, using planners. I have three planners. I'm a very busy lady. I have three written planners because I don't trust the phone to do it. If I write it down, I'll remember it. But using memory aids, it's okay to have a calendar. It's okay to have a planner. Planners are fun, planners are cute. If they're men, show them how to use it on their phone or maybe they wanna write it down, whatever it is. But making that memory aid to help them because, you know, give them those knowledge and skills to do it and then make that part of a routine. They want to stay independent. They want to be functional. They don't want to be a burden on anyone. And if we're giving them what they need, then they won't be. But we also can't forget, this moho, remember, the environment. Looking at their home environments. We do this with our clients all the time, whether we go into their homes, whether they bring us pictures or however it is. How can we remove physical barriers in their environment that might lead to falling? Can we show them that having that rug in the middle of the floor might lead to them tripping. Can we show them that having good lighting will help with their vision issues so that they'll be able to see the obstacles and then avoid them? You know, improving social interactions. How can we find, you know, help them find support, you know, digital support, you know, through the internet, through other support groups, also trying to eliminate the stigma that's associated with HIV, right? And then here in performance capacity, I talked about, um, you know, fati they fatigue quite easily. So energy conservation, we do that with all of our clients anyway, when they have chronic disease, right? We're always trying to work on, you know, how they can work smarter and not harder so they can stay in their homes. That's such a big deal for people. And I know with my family, you know, my grandfather's in his mid eighties, it's, we're so happy that he's in his house, that he's not in a, in a home. And again, I know some people can't avoid it, but we are doing our best to keep him out of a nursing home so that he can live his years in his house that he had with my grandma. That, that was their dream. They didn't want to leave their home. And so, yeah, 10 years ago, this OT and her nurse mother outfitted their house to make sure they could stay there. We had the doors wide and we had to grab bars. And at the time they were annoyed because they're like, we're not old. Now my grandpa is incredibly grateful that we've done that because it's done and he can just keep living in his house. And he is. If we as OTs know how to do this, that these things are important to our clients living with HIV. And then if we address these things, we can help them in order to live the life they want to live. We can give them the skills they need to be more informed and active clients. They can be active and be more accountable for their own health. But also this makes us better OTs because if we understand their symptoms. We know what's coming. We know what they're already living with because they've told us and we're hearing them and we're client centered. So we wanna make sure that what we do for them is the best we can do. We're better OTs as a result and we have better patient outcomes. 
And all this is what we want, right? This is all we want. We want them to live the life that they want to live. So that's, I'm stepping off of that soapbox and onto this one. So there were some limitations in my study. Recall bias. Individuals with cognitive issues are probably not going to remember everything, right? So my questions may have sounded, the answers, I'm sorry, to my questions may have sounded more like what I wanted them to sound like simply because when they didn't understand something, I gave them an example and they used my example. So there's recall bias. That happens with almost all qualitative studies. That's just what happens. And then there's a recruitment bias that I had because honestly, the people who wanted to participate in my study were people who were just interested in learning more. And these are more proactive people. So these are the ones who, um, when I turned my recorder off and I turned back into OT Amber versus Researcher Amber, and I gave them all folders. So not only did they get a gift card, they got a folder from me that had energy conservation techniques. It had medication stuff in it, calendars. All the stuff that I just talked about, I made folders for them and gave it to them. And so when I turned off the recorder and went back to being just OT Amber doing pro bono OT with these individuals, they were all so just happy and just grateful and showing how that they wanted to go through this and showing me pictures of their homes and asking me what they could do. And most of them told me repeatedly, they're like, why didn't I see y'all in the hospital? Like when I went to the hospital, I didn't, I don't know what an OT is. You, you're telling me what an OT is and I think y'all are great. Why, why wasn't I exposed to you in the hospital? I'm like, you know why? Because not everybody understands what an OT does in our scope of practice. And that's the truth. So I am really lobbying for the same thing that happens when we see stroke patients, where we are automatically consulted when we get a stroke patient. We are automatically consulted when we see a spinal cord patient. We are automatically consulted with certain diagnoses. This needs to be one of them so that we can start at the beginning of their care so that they can continue living their life. Because Certain things are going to happen, but if you don't tell people that, like with Parkinson's, they always tell the client, you know what, this is not going, until there's a cure, it's progressive. So we're going to try to help you maintain your independence for as long as possible. They tell them that up front. No one's telling these individuals this. And as OTs, we could, we're like, you know what, we're going to do everything we can to keep you in your home, to help you age in place as long as possible. And these are the things that we're going to work on which is what I did when I had them by myself, but they never got that in the hospital and it was a shame. And hopefully I combated that. Yesterday I gave a talk to our um, fourth year medical students who are about to transition to residency about what OTs do so that they know when to, con when to consult us. So I'm hoping that I was able to fix that. So what's my next step? So my project LEAF is my next step. Basically it's this here but I turned it into, I know I'm skipping around because I know I'm running out of time. So I'm trying to do, the, do that right. So I turned that Moho HIV thing into Project LEAF, which is basically this eight week um, wellness class that addresses you know, ADLs, art adherence, physical activity, cognitive skills, coping skills, prep education, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is basically a drug people can take so that they don't get HIV from their partner if they're currently HIV negative and their partner is currently HIV positive health literacy, which is a big deal because most people do not understand. Most people, doesn't matter what their socioeconomic status is, don't understand healthcare. And so when you're living with a chronic disease, it's important that you do. So that's one of the things we'll be working on while incorporating the eight dimensions of wellness and, and occupations into their lives. So I'll be doing this class once a week for about 90 minutes. And the plan is for me to do that in the fall, fall 21. My capstone student will be doing it the fall that summer. And then we plan to train people who've participated in how to deliver it so that we can keep the program going so we can get even more people doing it. And I did pilot this with um, one, of my, one of the participants from this um, study because I wanted to see if it would work and she was crying for help and I want to save the world. So I um, took my Thursdays before I started working academia. I, I did four tens and Thursday was my day off. So once I was done um, with my dissertation, I had time. So I um, took my Thursdays and I worked on these things with her and um, I'm still in contact with her and she's doing fantastic. 
and she is living a much better life than she was. So in conclusion, you know, okay. Because we're OTs, because of our unique way that we see the world and the way we see everything, we know how to modify risk factors for falls. We know how to do it. If we're given the opportunity to work with these clients, especially early on, we can really help with that. As I said, there is this article that I always quote, it's Rogers et al from 2016. Dr. Barlow is probably quite familiar with it. Um, well, OT is the one ancillary service in the hospital that saves the hospital's money. I quote it all the time because it's the truth. And the reason that it's true, the article says this, but we know this because we're OTs, is that we look at everything. We don't just look at that problem. Because if all, we're, if all we were doing was focusing on a problem, the problem wouldn't get fixed. We look at the whole situation, figure out what's going well, what isn't going well, and how we can improve the situation using the client and what they want to do that. And that's, we do that so well. We're just, we're an amazing profession. So my future research, as I just talked to you guys about, is me doing that eight week pilot based on that model that we created and the feedback we got from those participants to basically help these individuals age in place and learn how to manage, successfully manage and successfully age with HIV. And hopefully if it's successful, we can go all over the world with it because that's what we want to do. We want to help others. We just want everybody who's living with this disease until there's a cure to be able to live a long, happy, healthy life. Questions? Okay, I was trying to make sure I did get on time so that we could get to that. This is amazing. I learned so much. I'm pediatrics by trait, so I don't know if you know that. So this is like mind blowing to me. This yes. is great. We'll see, um, and I'm not peds at all. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm adult neuro, spinal cord actually. So, and that's the first thing people said was they're like, you're doing research on HIV and not spinal cord. I'm like, yes, in the clinic, spinal cord injuries, that is my thing, the higher, those are mine. C1 through C, those are my people. And that is, and neurodegenerative. So MS, Parkinson's, Guillain-Barre, ALS, those are my things. This is what I've done my whole career. I do stroke too. It's just not my specialty. You guys are getting that in June, I think, from Dr. Kitties. But, um, but yeah, I went on this crusade when my cousin died and I'm like, I want to save the world. So how can I do it as an OT? Well, um, in the future, you have this platform. So we have people from Tanzania, Guyana, Botswana, Germany, Kenya, Kuwait, oh, Rwanda, wow. and Uganda here today. So you may use this platform, however, if you want in the future. So yeah. um, this is great. No, I am. I'm like I said, I'm super blessed and happy that you guys allowed me to talk about this because I really wanted to own here are all my references. That's well, I was going to show you all my references. Yeah, it's a trip that I get to cite myself now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, I did not know where everyone was from that's here. So I apologize if I missed a few countries. Um, if anyone has a question, please either type it in the chat box or take yourselves off mute and feel free to ask. I see it. There's a hand up. Um, Nora's hand is up. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this uh, great uh, presentation. I really uh, like it. I would like to ask, there is a time frame for uh, such a specific um, intervention with these type of clients. Like for example, in our country, we have 45 minutes and six sessions for each individual. Oh. So uh, is this uh, good for this type of patient or it's, uh, yeah, there is no a specific time for that? So there's, it, there's no specific time. The way I look at it is, and that's a great question. So thank you for asking. You can't do enough is the way I look for it. Look at it, right? So anytime individuals get this information and we give them those skills, we're making, we're helping them reach their goals. We're helping them become more functional. And so you can, what I always did was I always worked this in to my sessions with these particular clients prior to me doing my actual research on it. Um, once I became more familiar with what was the mechanisms of HIV, what it looked like and the physical manifestations, because I'd get, you know, I worked, I worked at a um, neurological, I worked at, I worked at TIR, which is a big um, neuro rehab clinic in Houston, hospital clinics, whatever. And I would get clients who came 
to me who had strokes, but they also had HIV and the HIV is actually what caused the stroke. So they were coming to me after the fact and I would just work all this information, the same stuff I would do with, with the stroke patient that they needed, whatever was client sent me for that client. And then I'd work in this stuff too, if that makes sense. So imagine weight bearing with the client, because again, I'm adult neuro and that's what I would be doing. So I've got a client in quadruped and as we're in quadruped shifting their weights so that we can get more weight onto their affected side. I'm talking about injury conservation. I'm talking about medication management. I'm talking about those things while we're doing other stuff and giving them information on that so that they would have that as part of their home program too. So information, knowledge and skills is key. It doesn't matter when you do it. If you only see them one time, if you can just give them some of this information, you've already made a difference. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for asking. Does anyone else have a question? I think, is that Ika? Am I saying that right? Yeah, yes, it's Ika from Tanzania. I wanted to ask, like, what were the ways in which they used to withdraw from the denial state or what intervention were they using to go away from the denial and participate in other activities because we all know that sometimes we may find some other clients very difficult to engage in the other ADLs since they are still in the denial state and mm -hmm. they do not adhere to the medication. So what were their ways according to the research or what are the interventions which we can use in the early stages? Thank you. Okay, so that's a good question. So what are the, so if I, I'm gonna restate it to make sure that I understood it. So what you're asking is when someone's in the early stages, they just got diagnosed, they might be in denial. What were some mechanisms yeah. that you could use to get them to participate in occupational therapy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. The literature doesn't have a ton of stuff on it, unfortunately. Um, so this is anecdotal. And that's the reason I'm trying to get my stuff published and more stuff coming out so that I can have this stuff ready for you guys. But the same way that we use our therapeutic use of self to interact with our clients is the same thing for these clients too. So we don't focus on a diagnosis, right? We always focus on the patient and what the patient needs. So when I had clients, and I remember a guy in the ICU who had just recently been diagnosed with HIV, but at this point it had, it had already gone into phase because he, he didn't get tested, things have been happening. He came in with respiratory distress because that is what had happened. It, it evolved. And we didn't talk about the HIV itself. We just talked about ways that he could manage the symptoms that were around it. So I didn't go into this whole spiel, but oh, I'm an HIV researcher. Let me talk to you about this A, B, C, and D. It was more like, these are the things that you, that you want. You want to be able to get yourself dressed. You want to be independent. You don't want to rely on your wife for these things. And you also want to take your medication so that you'll be able to breathe without having to use this machine. So these are the things we're going to work on today. So it wasn't so much of me bombarding him with like HIV, HIV, HIV. It's more, this is what you want. These are the issues that you're having right now. And then these are the things we're going to work on. We're going to work on energy conservation because you're having a hard time breathing. We're going to work on fine motor coordination because you want to be able to cut your own food because right now you can't and we need to work on getting your grip strength better and your fine motor coordination so you can do that. So it wasn't so diagnosis driven. It was more like you wanted to be able to do these things again on your own. Now, when you do have those difficult clients who don't want OT, right? Cause like, that's my favorite. When OT walks into the room. I don't want to get dressed. I want to walk. And I'm like, but can you go to the bathroom by yourself? And I usually say much nicer than that. It's the way I say it to other OTs because y'all know what I'm saying. But um, I'm always like, okay, that's a great goal. You being able to walk is, is a good goal. And I, I appreciate that goal. However, there are other things that you also want to be able to do. What were you doing before XYZ, before you got here? Because those are the things we want to help you get back to doing. So that's usually how I broach those really difficult clients is I try to meet them where they're at because, you know, that's what we're supposed to do as OTs, right? Use a therapeutic use of self and just ask, you know, on their level, what, what do you want? And if they do want to walk, we can start in standing. 
we can do some things in standing if they can stand, if they have that ability. Let's let's brush your teeth in standing. So, I, I I hope I'm answering your question. I'm trying I'm trying to, but like I said, there's just I never just led with oh you have AIDS. I always make sure that we look at the full picture of the client. I do that with every client, no matter what the diagnosis is. There's a question in the chat box. How best can we improve recovery and stroke among person living with HIV? The same thing that you would do with, a, with another stroke patient, those same interventions where we're focusing on helping them regain function, remediate function, and when we can't remediate, we compensate. It's the same thing with our HIV patients. We just wanna make sure that we're cognizant of those extra layers that come with those HIV patients. Things like the medication adherence because they're, they're at risk for another stroke if they're not taking their medication. Um, you know, there's a progression that we like to do, um, positioning, you know, manual therapy, mobilization. So positioning, mobilization, mobilization to weight bearing, weight bearing to forced use, forced use to functional. Does that sound kind of familiar to y'all who work with stroke patients? So it's the same thing that you would do with a stroke patient who also has HIV. The difference is, like I said, you have to address those other things that we know come with the HIV, like the easily to fatigue. We have to address that. We have to address that they got to take their medication. We have to address those balance issues because the HIV doesn't help those balance issues and neither did the stroke. So it's just being cognizant that there's that other layer with the stroke. So it's not just that they had a stroke. It's that they had a stroke and they have this whole chronic disease with that. And there's probably other comorbidities too. They probably had diabetes or hypertension or something else as well, along with the HIV. So like I said, it's just, it's, we can't just treat that deficit. I hope I'm answering these questions because I can't see also, I have no idea if I'm answering your questions or not. I just want to make sure that we remember, we, we treat all of our clients and we treat the client, not the condition. So if you're just cognizant of all the things that go along with the condition, along with whatever it is we're trying to work on, you can't go wrong. Ika's hand is up again. So I don't know if I if I answered her question fully. Hi, um, you did answer my question. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clear that. I understood <laughs> the last example was the one which I wanted, like how you confront the clients, the ones which are very hard at taking the occupational therapy sessions. So mm -hmm. thank you, I got the answers. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, clear. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, and we, we all know, we all know what that's like. We all know what it's like when you walk into the room and you're all bright and shiny. Like I'm such a morning person. So I would always start my day super early in rehab, like 7.30. I'm like, good morning, Mr. So-and-so. And they're like, Amber, why are you so happy? I'm like, it's a new day. And I could have had like the worst day ever, but I'm always happy when I go to work. And, you know, they're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to work with, you know, I don't want to work with my blocks. I'm like, okay, so let's not. What are you into? I want to fish. Cool. And I go find fishing stuff. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's work on your fine motor coordination. You are going to string this lure on this hook. I'm getting the same thing accomplished. I'm still doing fine motor coordination and they're doing what they want to do. And then they don't realize they're even doing OT. They're like, oh, this is OT. Mm -hmm. Keep working. Use both of those hands. So I'm going to bother you with one last question and then we will officially run out of time. Okay, that's <laughs> another question. So he says, um, literally some people living with HIV tend to get weak so easily during therapy. This puzzles me so much. Why is it that way? Because the virus, Dennis, thank you for your question. The virus depletes those cells that make their muscles weak. Basically they atrophy, their muscles atrophy. They get very tired. The respiratory system is now compromised. Their muscles are now atrophying as a result. And so that's why they get so tired. So now that you know that, that the virus is what's causing that, when you're doing your interventions with these in individuals, you can be cognizant and maybe pace your way through what you're doing with them, you know, like grading the task. 
so that maybe you don't do the arm bike for 15 minutes. Maybe you only do the arm bike for five so that you have more time to do other things. And yeah, they do get tired easily and energy conservation comes in. And it's the same thing during our interventions. Just like we would teach them energy conservation for home, we do that in our interventions. Just like when you work with a patient who's living with um, ALS, right? Lou Gehrig's disease. You, we don't wanna over fatigue them, right? At all, because we know that if we do, it's going to take them so much longer to try to recover from it. And it's, it's not good, it's not good to do that. <laughs> with these individuals, you can push them, but just be cognizant that they're going to fatigue easily. So grade your task, make your plan of care accordingly to where you stagger those, in, those higher intensity exercises that you're doing with them. Or if you're doing like a shower activity, you help them pace their way through it because you know that shower is gonna make them tired. So Dennis, did I answer your question? I can talk for hours about this. I was really just hoping I could make this less than an hour when I, when I did it, so. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. And if anyone has follow up questions or you think of them, you know, next week, um, please feel free to email them and I will forward them on. Yes, the and I will. Said. I will gladly answer those. Like I said, this is my passion, so I can definitely talk about this forever. And so I will turn this into a PDF. I will send that to you, Dr. Barlow. And it was a pleasure. Absolute pleasure to talk to all of you. This so, is great. Thank you. Yes.